Let's begin. Uh, the Age of Revolution, uh, Europe from 1789 to 1870. Uh, dates not so arbitrarily chosen, beginning of the French Revolution, to uh, the year that Italy fully nationalizes uh, its unification and, and Germany the, the following year. And so up to the brink of modernity, if you will. Four sessions. First session, uh, I, I used cutesy little titles for each of the four. The first one is The World Turned Upside Down. And we're going to talk about today and uh, early industrialization, uh, the Enlightenment, the French Revolution, Napoleon, and the reaction to the revolution and Napoleon. So, uh, why not fight off big chunks of history while we have them on the table? The second section, which I've called The Heart is a Lonely Hunter, is going to cover topics ranging from nationalism, romanticism, and utopian socialism, early 19th century socialism, pre-Marxian socialism. The third session, Brave New World, of responses to industrialization. So we're going to look at classic liberalism, uh, mature socialism, and what will start calling itself communism, uh, not just because of Marx, but largely because of him. And in the final session, uh, from a favorite aria of mine in the third act of Aida, O Patria Mia, nation, society, and social science. So the making of the modern nation state and the emergence of a category uh, for the new sciences called society, looking at humans in their group complexity, not just in their individual psychology and, and motivation structure. Anyhow, with that in mind, uh, jumping to the first slide, this is really an overview of what I expect to be able to accomplish in the class. Uh, there's a transition from pre-industrial society, and I've used the term here stability, uh, by which, as you'll see in the bullet points within that box, uh, a world in which identity and social relationships were, were not very fluid, but uh, we're, we're sort of frozen in tradition. So the political structure was feudal. Uh, the estates of church, the aristocracy and the commons. People had a role, they were set in their role. Agricultural subsistence was the nature of the economy. And it depended largely on the banks of a bound peasantry or serfdom. The society was traditional. As I mentioned a minute ago, the social roles and relationships were hardened. Self-identity was stable and well-defined. You didn't ask who you were. There wasn't this sense of uh, that, that modern characteristic that we see beginning with people like uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau asking, who am I and why do I feel alienated in the world I find myself in? Rather, uh, the world told you who you were and, and everything around you told you who you were and what your status was and what your role was. It's a society that was largely local. Bulk of the population probably never moved more than, within a lifetime, more than a radius of 10 miles from uh, where their family had settled. It's a world of illiteracy and, and lack of accessible media. And, and so the church had uh, a, a gargantuan role in supplying uh, the vision that it had of your identity and of your expectations for the future and an afterlife for that matter. And there was very little sense because of this localism of class or nationality, because you couldn't compare yourself to anybody. 
You, you were Lou who lived next to the mill. You were not a peasant of an order that you knew existed everywhere just like you. So, so this kind of self-aware categorization that will come to mean something else in uh, the 19th century, particularly, uh, just was entirely lacking in the pre-industrial world. Now, the 18th century initiates a series of uh, tremendous disruption. And largely, and I'm, and I'm going to emphasize this uh, through all four sessions, the economic and demographic crises caused by industrialization. There's huge population expansion and displacement. Uh, the population of England between 1700 and 1850 goes up something like 500%. Uh, the industrialization and enforced reorganization of agricultural land, it had to be rationalized to be able to produce the amount of food that the population explosion was going to require. And this went hand in hand with industrialization. And as a result of both of these, uh, severe price inflations, because the, as Thomas Malthus in the early 19th century will tell us, uh, population grows exponentially, whereas the means to serve that population, food growth and the like, uh, increases arithmetically. There, we're going to see the disintegrating position of the nobility. This had been going on ever since the 16th century, really, and we addressed it a bit in anybody who was in our, our, the class on, on the Reformation and Counter-Reformation. Uh, listened as I, as I pointed out that the nobility was under siege. They were losing their traditional military role, and they were losing it uh, because of technology fact that gunpowder had displaced them and created vast armies of infantrymen who were at the uh, monarch's disposal. They, he could, a monarch could dispose of the need for having an aristocratic feudal nobility sworn to service. Rents were raised and land was enclosed and this what really was used by the nobles as a way of trying to reassert control, but it meant that it was going to face all kinds of crisis and threatened social revolution as a result. Uh, increased mobility in the 18th century, and with the increased mobility, because populations are moving into cities, new categories for self-identification are, are going to replace the old ones. And there's a, a real jump in media, literacy, and ideology. The printing press has democratized but in, in places in Western Europe, certainly in England and France, with cheap broadside uh, printing. Just like Ben Franklin in the Americas, you get these one-page sheets that could come out and be read by somebody who had literacy in any neighborhood and could tell people what was going on in the political world or in the social world. And this is the way that Enlightenment ideals uh, first became popularized. So, so that during the French Revolution, lots of people knew what Voltaire had argued. And lots of people heard uh, the, the inflammatory uh, remarks of, of a Jean-Jacques Rousseau from 20 years earlier for the first time. Then it's beginning in 1789, uh, which is the period we're facing, all of this comes to a head. So it's going to be a period of class consciousness being raised, political revolutions of every sort, uh, bourgeois revolutions demanding constitutionalism, Worker revolts and insurrections, 
uh, demanding redistribution of, of, of goods, uh, machine destruction in places in England by people who felt they were being displaced by the, the new machinery that was invented for the textile industry. All sorts. Radical new theories of human nature, economics, society, and history. And we'll take a look at the uh, movement in intellectual development in the period. Nationalistic and ethnic identification is going to erupt after 1789 because what nationalism does is it fills the void of the for, that was created by the breakdown of community with all the population movement. As people lose local, medieval localist identity, uh, they need a new narrative to tell themselves who they are. And they're going to turn to nationalism and the sorts of ethnic identification uh, that, that nationalism uh, battens down on. And remember, much of the sort of uh, toxic nationalism, as we come to identify it, is not traditional in the sense that prior to the year 1800, very little of it existed. It's really a, an early modern construct, which we'll talk about as, as we get into the class. And then, of course, the, the actual creation of new nation states. And I will, I will talk about the development of England as a nation state, uh, even though it w or already was one, uh, but its maturation in the 19th century. But I will formally address Italy and Germany as, as totally new and novel constructs. And the reason I focus on the Western European countries is that they are ahead of the Eastern part of Europe in these developments. The Eastern part of Europe will catch up, but a lot of that catching up is going to be post 1850. So a lot of our focus will be on, on uh, the, the Western part of the map. Speaking of which, we have a map. So it's a map of Europe in 1789. And you'll notice under the, uh, the names of countries that it tells you what the uh, population, the approximate population was in 1789. And you'll see, for instance, that France is double the population of Great Britain in 1789, and which made them a major, the major political player. Um, I would say that that would have been true also of the Habsburg monarchy, except that, as you see, the Habsburg monarchy really sat on multiple nationalities. And here, I'm going to get my pointer up here. Yeah, the spotlight. Except this, this represents this block of yellow actually represents lots of different languages and nationalities. Um, you see that in the blue box that I've drawn that, that we're going to focus on the Western zone because the elimination of pre-industrial serfdom was there, totally complete uh, in th this early period. The development of international trade uh, was dominated by Western Europe because of the access to the Atlantic. Uh, earlier Renaissance trade, Italy was the center of the Mediterranean trade because stuff was coming over land from Asia and then being transported to Italy via the Mediterranean. But as soon as the voyages of, of exploration discovered that going west and southwest from the Atlantic coast of Europe uh, was a faster way to get to, for instance, India and China and Japan, the dominant powers became the, the Western European powers. 
and the earliest industrial development is going to be done in the West. And we'll, we'll see lots of maps looking at that. Uh, in the Eastern and Southern zones, serfdom lingers. Therefore, the economy is more traditional. Therefore, there's in the early phases, there's little industrial development. There's a population boom in the 18th century for lots of reasons. There's a lower death rate being the big reason. Uh, there's largely the absence of uh, plague outbreaks of the severity that existed in the 17th century. Smallpox outbreaks in England and in other places in Europe in the 17th century were horrendous. Uh, they, they developed smallpox inoculation in the 18th century, which, which had a huge impact. And in Western locations, particularly in England, improvements in public health, water supply, for instance, had an impact. And warfare was limited. The horror of the Thirty Years' War of the 17th century, in which all of Central Europe had Catholics and Protestants at each other's throats to, to the tune of 20 million deaths. Nothing quite like that in the 18th century. So there was also an agricultural revolution. They had to feed this increasing uh, population. They developed uh, scientific techniques of crop rotation. The English pioneered Enclosures. This meant, you know, a, a lot of late medieval farming had patches of land cut into ownership strips, and it would it meant for very inefficient methods of fertilization, and and really soil enrichment. It took the great landowners of England to use really uh, dicey methods to force people off those small strips and to buy people out and the like, and to consolidate them into larger units, which could be irrigated and fertilized as the land topology uh, best recommended. But this meant that there were huge numbers of this oh, I, my mouth is off. Well, huge numbers of displaced rural workers, and those rural workers were going to make their way into towns, which is one of the reasons why, as you'll see in the next slide, uh, industrialization in places like England, where the land enclosure movement was most aggressive, uh, developed ahead of anyone else's. The pitting of the aristocracy uh, in a class rivalry with the new bourgeoisie that had taken root in all the cities of the German, French, and English-speaking areas on the map. Uh, monarchs now had a natural ally in the bourgeoisie. They could borrow money from the rich bankers. Uh, they could diminish the aristocracy's claims on their authority by asserting divine right. And the colonial system that they were developing through the importation, for, particularly in places like Spain, of, of, of metals, and in England and Holland by the importations of things like sugar and tobacco, meant that the monarch had uh, bourgeois trade systems that they could tax. And the mercantilist system tried to protect the industries that they wanted to tax. Plus the fact that, as I said earlier, warfare had displaced the role of the aristocracy. So we're going to have uh, the rise of this bourgeoisie. And, and when we start looking at the French Revolution, we see that, uh, we will see that the really largest class to benefit from the rise is, is certainly not a worker class of any kind, but it's a bourgeois class, whether it be 
petty bourgeois or, or, or grand bourgeois. Moving on uh, to this slide, I wanted to talk about the uh, early part of the Industrial Revolution and the question of England and why England is, is the name I give to this first industrial nation slide uh, major bullet. Well, first of all, the agricultural reforms, crop rotation and technology and the enclosures, which we've talked about. The fact that English, the English have a population boom. Within the 18th century proper, the population doubles and we have fairly accurate uh, censuses, one taken in 1696 because of the parish system, everybody had to register births and, and weddings and things like this at their local parish, no matter which sect they belong to. And, and they could trace, we could trace from parish registers that the censuses were quite accurate. And then there's another one in 1801. The urbanization movement that was taking place in the 18th century. The fact that there were financial and social innovations that supported industrialization. One was the early formation of the Bank of England. And it meant that all currency and capital moves could be controlled from one central agency. The English also were early in the development of stock companies and the system of limited liability, which protected stock owners from suit. So if your company that you invested in went belly up, you're, you were not personally liable for the losses of whatever capital. So if a, if a ship, if you decided to invest in ships that were making voyages for the East India Company, bringing back nutmeg and tea and whatever from Indonesia, you could buy shares, and if the ship went down, you could not be sued uh, as one of the officers of the company. And so it encouraged people to build stock companies. And uh, not to be underestimated, the loosening in England, in the late 17th century, through the passage of a couple of bills in Parliament of entail on estates, the medieval entail system was a series of laws by which you could not sell or alienate the land that belonged to the large landed families. They, the only way a sale was going to be able to take place would be if the generation the several generations that stood in line for an inheritance all agreed. And this, this never happened. But the laws loosened up so that if, if the next generation on reaching the age of 21 agreed to a deal to sell land off, the older generation could execute on that sale. What this meant was that the 98% of real wealth represented in England in landed value, some of that could be sold off to produce investable capital to be used in stock companies and to be housed, for instance, in the Bank of England. And so the access to capital was really far outweighed, for instance, the, next, the value of the next bullet or two, the development of technology. Technology, and we'll get to those bullets in a second, I want to point out they don't create opportunity as much as follow and develop opportunity. They don't precipitate industrial development. They go along with it already 
having been triggered. When the need is there, somebody finds the invention you need. But, but the opportunity precedes it. The first technology in any industrial revolution from the late, the mid 18th, all the way up through the early 19th century is textiles, low cost of entry. Everybody needs shirts. You have a mass consumer need already. And cotton and wool was already being produced for the population of the planet. Uh, if you could make it a little more cheaply, a little more quickly, and with mechanization, all to the good. It's the easiest way to steal a march in technology um, on industrialization. And so in the 18th century, the flying shuttle, the spinning jenny, the spinning frame, the spinning mule, the power loom, every, all of these get uh, developed by these um, real tinkering inventors in England and some in France and some in Germany in uh, the late 18th century. The other technology that begins to develop in the period is mining and essentially because of the ease of transport, it develops very aggressively in England. Now, I'll jump a couple of bullets for a second. This map here, I could probably expand it a little bit, shows uh, the waterway system in England in 1790 and the hatched areas show where there are coal fields. They overlap with the waterways. So the fact was that you could um, get coal to markets fairly expeditiously. In fact, in England, given the, the, the canal development of the mid 18th century, no place in England at the time was more than 73 miles everybody was within 73 miles from a navigable river or canal that supported barge traffic. So you could move stuff around. And before railroads, this was what you needed to be able to do. Water travel uh, in the 18th century was so far superior to land travel of any kind. Uh, I read somewhere somebody uh, wrote a paper that tracked that you could get a letter from Constantinople to London in something like five days or four days, but to get a letter from the Carpathian Mountains to Constantinople could take six weeks in the 18th century, just to give us a, a general picture. Also, the steam engines, uh, the New Common and Watt steam engines were developed, and they were developed around mining, and they were not developed to get coal out of the mines. They were developed to pump water out of the mines. Only when Watt took a close look at his pumping system, did he realize he could use the same engine to pull trams filled with coal out of the mines. And then a bunch of very clever people said, that's great. We put the trams on track and your little engine winches it up to the top. Why can't we run those tracks uh, at distances. And coal mining and the coke that it produced, we discovered also is uh, very useful in iron smelting, which would in turn contribute to the building of the railroads that were the result of the steam engine. So, so we, we wind up this is the period in which several, 
what I call later down this slide, virtuous circles uh, begin to develop. In fact, let's jump over there. So by 1760, a historian, W.W. W. Rostow, refers to 1760 in England. He's an economic historian. And he says from doing very considerable research, it's in 1760 that the economy reached a self-sustaining takeoff path. The launch was made. Much, much the way, uh, remember when we're back in the 60s when we're trying to get into space and they would always tell you about rockets needing a velocity before it, it, it reached sufficient uh, takeoff velocity to be free of the Earth's pull. So with an economy. And the virtuous circle, mean that expanding revenue could fund greater investment, which in turn would produce more competition, which in turn would produce lower prices, which in turn creates new markets. So in the beginning, you begin with textile production to fill the orders that you're getting for shirts and, and jackets and dresses. As you, as the virtuous circle expands and the entire industry gets bigger and more technical, more technologically sophisticated, and more people enter the field of production and prices get lowered, it's not a zero sum game. That lowering of prices means you can sell to further away markets and to more people who could not afford things before. Remember the, the great uh, response of Henry Ford when asked why he paid his, his workers, his factory workers, so much money in like 1915 or whenever it was. And he said, so they can buy my cars. He was trying to create a virtuous circle. So also in England, and not to be underestimated, is the, uh, the political backdrop. It's the age of the so-called Whig ascendancy, the Whig liberals, the, which the, uh, really the economic and political liberal thinking that powered uh, the bourgeoisie, the capitalist class in England these people had real power. Many of them came from the old aristocracy. And, and indeed, by the time you get to 1760, the, the names Whig and Tory don't really have a whole lot of distinctive meaning because everybody was dabbling at this point in, in the new ways of making money and jumping into the new markets. But England gets there first. And, and it becomes, um, as we will see later on, desperately threatening to some of the other countries in Western Europe. Moving along, why does uh, the revolutions of, of industrialization and the new liberal economics and the new political theory take such an intellectual hold? largely because they depend on the enlightenment backdrop that they sit on top of. And, and this is sort of the in intellectual underpinning that supports the modern world. And in the first bullet, uh, I talk about enlightenment rationalism and empiricism. Religious and political authority gives way to analytical disciplines based on mathematics, uh, rationalism, or experimental science, empiricism. And the, the, the gods of the rationalists, Descartes, Voltaire, the philosophes, the French philosophers of the 18th century, many of them, the d'Alemberts, um, the encyclopedists, and their, even their religious belief takes on uh, the, the rationalist drapery of what's called deism. 
uh, the rational God, not the God of the Old Testament, but a, a, a God of the universe as a great clock that must have required a clock maker, that God, and the Anglo-Scottish empiricists, uh, John Locke, Bishop Barclay, David Hume, we have a picture of Locke over here. Locke is probably, if you have to pick a philosopher from uh, the previous century, the late 17th, that has the largest impact on the world we're coming into, you would have to make a case for Locke. And I, and I pick three very influential people to use for our uh, photo gallery on the right here, John Locke, uh, Montesquieu and, and, and Adam Smith, but also in this period, the development of contract theory. Political legitimacy is, is seen in the late 17th century among the philosophical classes as being based on individual rights and the social contracts that were made in the state of nature. So political legitimacy and claims to authority come from the individual as the individual assents in a social bond called a contract. And so the, the individualism underpinning uh, French assertions of uh, the, the revolutionaries, the bourgeois revolutionaries of the early revolution, are born in this kind of contract theory. And the concept of property, possessive individualism, as some historians have called it, property is described by Locke and the early uh, English liberal philosophers as a right that precedes political sovereignty. Locke, Locke and the Anglo-Scottish philosophers all agree on this. So when the American Revolution takes place in the 1770s, the claim of no taxation without representation says that before you, the Crown and Parliament of England, can assert your political authority over us before you get there, there is a prior right that we are claiming in our property. You only have rights to a tax share of that property if indeed the social contract that we have made with each other and one another and with you is substantially honored. You violate that social contract and, and, and we withdraw our property claim. A theory of moral sentiment that is going to have a large influence in the 19th century, that the development am among largely the English and the Scots, that people are guided by a moral sense called sympathy that isn't merely rational or rationalist, um, is going to, when we start looking at things like romanticism and the urge to nationalism, a lot of the early uh, thinkers and, and, and ideologues of, and, and really uh, students of those traditions are going to point to elements in them that are what they are going to claim is superior to impoverished, mere rationalist visions of the world. So something else that comes out of the Enlightenment heritage that's going to contribute to 19th century development. And the development of social sciences, uh, again, by largely the Scots in this case, uh, science can observe and determine the nature of human organization and activity. Well, what do we see in the 19th century with everyone from, from Karl Marx to um, Charles Darwin but that science can tell us more about who we are and therefore what we should be and how we should constitute ourselves than uh, tradition. Based on uh, the science, political constitutions, 
could be based on rational models, Montesquieu, Rousseau, the philosophers, and a confidence which the 19th century was not short on, uh, a confidence in progressivism. Every day and every way, we are going to be bigger and better. Um, whoops, um, something is wrong. There we go. But the optimistic anticipation of a brave new world, which was not shared by Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, we'll talk about that at some point. So, let's move to the French Revolution, racing right along. Uh, we get to 1789. There's a debt and fiscal crisis in France, largely because of colonial wars, the American Revolution, and which they supported, heavy taxation, and a lot of fiscal mismanagement. Uh, the French economy probably was in decent shape, except for the excesses of monarchical ambitions in the period. So as a result of that in 1789, there is a, an incredible price inflation. There's a spring of bad harvests, drought and cattle disease right around those late years, 88, 89. Uh, grain is deregulated, the price of grain, which means that bread prices skyrocket. And so there's a lot of social unrest among uh, the peasantry and the urban poor. And we'll... And the urban poor is in Paris and the capital is always plays an outsized role in all developments. They have in 1789, a working model. The American Revolution has happened. And the American founders are steeped in two traditions that we talked about a bit in the earlier slide, the previous slide, Enlightenment rationalism and the English constitution which I'm going to point out, as, because there's an arrow pointing to the right, France is not steeped in English constitution. So before we even get to that box there, um, aristocratic and clerical privileges uh, meant that you had a gigantic non-tax paying dependency of the uh, that was keeping the entire society uh, rather poor, that these two classes uh, dominated political power and that they were heavily resented by the bourgeoisie. Remember, this did not exist. There was no aristocratic or uh, privileged clerical class in America in, in, in colonial America in the 18th century. Nor did uh, France have the constitutional tradition that America had. So France had none of the liberal reform institutions of England. The bourgeoisie was caged in an out within the boundaries of an outmoded feudalism. America's dominant class was a liberal bourgeoisie with roots in the English constitution. So why does a revolution that is a revolution happen in France, but is it really a revolution as it happens in America? Well, for the obvious reasons. We, we, we change governments in the Americas without changing any of the, or calling into question for that matter, any of questions about or issues of property ownership of of class treatment and the like. Uh, France is a very different circumstance. So in 1789, the third estate, the commoners, uh, assert their voice and the states general, which will become later on the National Assembly, is called representatives of the clergy and the nobility have to jockey for position because the commoners are screaming. And the commoners are really uh, members of the higher bourgeois classes. They're the lawyers and, and, and the larger property owners um, within France. This is, this is not the guy who, uh, this is not the cobbler down at the corner. 
A national assembly introduces voting by head, not by a state, so it gets controlled by uh, commoners voting. There's a food crisis which precipitates the, the great fear and the storming of the Bastille. We have a little picture of the storming. There were about 18 million pictures of the storming of the Bastille. And we have the uh, Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen uh, with its uh, abolition of feudal rights declared. And very significant historical document, very influenced by the Declaration of Independence. So 1789 comes and goes, and then the revolution takes on uh, its aggressive and angrier phases. And, and what we have becomes the template of many political revolutions that are going to follow in the 19th century. Uh, the pattern becomes that it's begun by bourgeois liberals looking for constitutional reforms and, and a better political deal for their class in the society, producing angrier elements that keep on outflanking them to the left. And so you don't get far along in the revolutionary movements until somebody is accusing you of being the, the, the soft reformer, the Uncle Tom, the, the person who's been bought off. And and this happens in a kind of accelerated, kaleidoscopic three years, four years, five years in the early part of the French Revolution. Um, by 1794, they be, groups have begun to organize themselves, the so-called political clubs, the Breton Club, the Society, 1789, the Jacobins, the Cordeliers, all these groups uh, take stances, accuse each other of being too far to the right, too extreme, too this, too that, too much in bed uh, with the monarchy. And so we have this mashup, these clubs, of political, they're part political party, they're part representatives of the class, and, and they're partly social societies of people who just knew each other and hang out with each other. Early on, they espouse a range of liberal reforms. Um, for instance, constitutional monarchy. But when the outside world, particularly the, the grand old imperial structures of Prussia, Austro-Hungary, and Britain, realize that this is going way more radical than the American Revolution did. They start forming political coalitions and threaten interventions because the right wing within France, of course, is inviting them in. And so you get, you get the first coalition. There'll be, by the time Napoleon falls, there'll have been something like eight coalitions. And, and this threat from outside, of course, bans everyone who has any level of revolutionary sentiment more closely together. It takes nothing like an outside threat to radicalize. And then the march towards continual and continuous radicalization takes place. So the execution of Louis the Sixteenth, the establishment of the Republic, the, de the development of the Committee of Public Safety with Danton and Robespierre, uh, the reign of terror, the introduction of the guillotine, and the revolutionary tendency to, as they say, eat its own, uh, so that a Robespierre has got to turn on a Danton by, by 94. And finally, uh, 
another reaction and the, and the death of, of Robespierre. All through this, uh, the role played by the sans-culottes, the, the street mob uh, that personifies populist anger, led by the, the mad priest, Jacques Roux, the enragé, they drive progressive radicalization of the revolution and represent what was most feared by Anglo-American reformers. It's right at this time that Americans and Brits who were initially uh, pro-revolutionary, thinking of the American Revolution as the model, become horrified. I have a, included the picture of the death of Marat by Jacques-Louis David, just because it's such a great picture. Charlotte Corday has been there on her visit. And uh, we find, and, and we will find that out in the provinces, conservatism still has uh, a, a foothold, a powerful foothold. And even in Paris, there are classes that are finally fed up with Robespierre and, and, and the most extreme of the leftist elements within the revolution. Uh, the Catholics, of course, are back on their heels. The, the nobility has either escaped the country, or been guillotined, or given up their titles. Uh, and it was the best of times and the worst of times. So, by 1795, the Directory has replaced the National Convention. It's still Republican, but distrustful, uh, distrustful of democratic excess. It's prone to corruption. And there are two wars going on. The outside world is, is trying to restore the French monarchy. And there's been an uprising internally in the Vendée region of France. Provincial monarchists and with Catholic sentiment are rising up to lead a counter revolution. Uh, the directory uses uh, a young general, uh, a charismatic uh, general in the Republic to uh, face its external enemies. The young Napoleon Bonaparte uh, comes into the spotlight, and we have an early picture of him in Italy at Pont Arcole. He is the defender of law and order and, and becomes the consul, the coup of the 18th Brumaire in the middle picture from 1799. He maneuvers politically to get himself uh, declared the consul. And, and we are launched into the Napoleonic era and the romanticization of the character of Napoleon. And Napoleon stands as a kind of titan in uh, European history, right down to the Gilded Age of the 1890s, when you would still hear the phrase that somebody or other was a, a Napoleon of, of finance or something like that. Napoleon becomes the, the metaphor for for the great man theory of history all through the 19th century. I love this uh, uh, David painting. Anyhow, and since I can't get enough of uh, Ang portraiture, you see Napoleon as first consul on the left, and Napoleon on his imperial throne when he's finally accepted the crown. Um, that's got to be one of the great, the greatest portraits in existence of anybody. Anyhow, you'll you'll notice I have a weakness for showing favorite art, whether or not they advance my arguments as we march through history. But you'll see them nonetheless. Uh, and yet again, so here we have the con Napoleon as the conqueror. Uh, he, he was the consul. He was the emperor. Now he's the conqueror. Here is. Uh, Napoleon at Austerlitz in 1805, his uh, great victory against the Austrians. 
defeated the Third Coalition. At by this point, the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805, Nelson has won the Great Sea Battle. The, the English own the, the, the navy and the seas. Uh, and, and indeed, what's in place by 1805 is the so-called continental system. Napoleon's success on land, and he forces everyone to do business through the French trade monopolies, is counter by the English control of the seas where they control all, all ports. So he embargoes British trade, but they can't trade with colonies or trade outside of England because the outside of France, I should say, or the continent, because um, England, the English Navy has dominated uh, the seas. And in fact, its only rival really becomes at times the American Navy which sometime act as privateers in the interest of the French in the same period. So, but here he is as the Grand Con, and it's in this, up until this time, and up until his self-made imperial status, he was often seen as he moves into the rest of Europe, he is seen as something of a liberator. He is bringing French enlightenment, freedom from serfdom, uh, the, the modern age of, of literacy, uh, the, the removal of anti-Semitic laws in places that he comes to dominate. Um, he, he, the early part of his movement into Europe will be welcomed with open arms. We have the Eroica Symphony of Beethoven. You know, this is the hero coming. And he is the man who, who Hegel will see as the first and best example of the great, his theory of history being made by great men, great individuals who embody the spirit of the moment, the ideals of the moment. Anyhow, Napoleon also gives us total war. So at Wagram, um, a massive battle. And it's a victory for Napoleon, sort of, over 300 thousand men are engaged in Bagram and with 80,000 casualties. So it's one of those battles that we don't see again until really the American Civil War or, or really World War I. And it's because of battles like this, by the way, that when, as we'll see, when 1815 comes and, and the, uh, the treaties that decide what the map of Europe should look like after the fall of Napoleon, there's great interest in establishing the first great balance of power coalitions uh, with spheres of influence. Okay, you guys get to do whatever you want here, and we get to do whatever we want there, and nobody treads on each other's turf, because if anybody does, the rest of us are coming together for you. And so um, the horrors of the later Napoleonic Wars were not lost on the English, the, the Prussians, and the Austrians. So what do we have from Napoleon here? We have uh, nationalism. The success of the French armies under the Republic and under Napoleon owed much to the new and vibrant sense of French patriotism. So he had a remarkably spirited army that would allow him to, to ask 150,000 people to come and march to their deaths, for instance. Revolution and reform, the efficiency and morale of Napoleon's officer corps 
owed much to promotion from the ranks based on merit. This was, uh, his army was a meritocracy. His field marshals, like Bay, were, were people who came up really from very common uh, backgrounds to become the great men of France under, under Napoleon. And revolutionary ideals. Initially, French armies were often welcomed as agents of the revolution and liberators of the oppressed in the beginning. So at the height of Napoleonic success, so Europe in 1812, so in, you can tell from the, this color coordination map I've got for you up here, uh, in the dark lavender are uh, the, the, what France was in 1804, in the lighter lavender, so these sections of Italy in particular, and, and sections of what would now be uh, Catalonia in Spain, we have acquired territories that he just claimed and little bits of Savoy into, into the Piedmont in Italy, uh, in Switzerland, French just, France just acquired them. The dependencies were areas that were liberated by war that were not incorporated into France, but served as strong allies. So the Confederation of the Rhine, for instance, uh, the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, the Northern Kingdom of Italy, Switzerland, um, was a dependency. Austria, you'll see in yellow here, uh, simply because after the defeat in 89, they, they signed a, a treaty with him, a non-interference treaty, so that he's basically uh, an, you know, technically an ally of those, but, but not really. So you have the first, Portugal has not been brought within the loop, and, and Sicily, not really itself, not really within the loop, and the Kingdom of Sardinia, which will later on join with the Piedmont, but at this point. So the hard red lines showing his, his um, control. In 1815, well, first, between 1812 and 1815, we have uh, the disastrous campaign in Russia uh, and the Allied victories in Spain under Wellington, in Germany under Blücher, and at Waterloo under both of them, uh, Wellington, Arthur Wellesley and, and Field Marshal Blücher at Waterloo. And we have the Bourbon Restoration of Louis XVIII in France, a constitutional monarchy is set up again, uh, which has to maintain many of the major reforms that were instituted by Napoleon. No attempt uh, was made to restore seized aristocratic properties. Some titles came back though, that sort of thing. And the great Congress of Vienna, at which a balance of power, an attempt to reestablish a balance of power was made. And the major players, uh, some very conservative elements like uh, Metternich, the chancellor of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, who is really an arch conservative and will maintain his influence and power in Austria and, and his kind of right-wing vision of what the world should look like until 1848. The Tsar and the Tsars were never famous for their liberalism. Uh, Frederick William of Prussia. And Prussia will begin to play an outsized role in Europe as we get to the middle of the next century. The, the Frenchman, the clever... Frenchman 
Talleyrand who tries to play every side of every fence, and Viscount Castlereagh, the Englishman who is probably most responsible in this group for making sure that the French were not penalized too much because he wanted to remove any potential causes that, that would be in place uh, for further war. Uh, the English, by this point, the English trade domination was um, significant enough, by the time you get to 1850, that the English had a great investment in eliminating warfare. Let their, let their industrial and, and commercial empire, backed by the English Navy, and supported by and protected by the English Navy, have the field to itself. So the English, English liberalism was much in favor of a France that looked like them, actually. Uh, the last thing they needed was uh, another Napoleon rising up from the ashes. So, in this map, what we see is Europe after the Congress of Vienna. Uh, France looks much as it did look earlier on. Some of those parts claimed by Napoleon, the Piedmont, uh, a section of, of what is still now Italy, uh, is restored to at what will later become part of Italy. It's its own place. It's part of the kingdom of the Piedmont, Piedmont and Sardinia. And, uh, but it's a part of, it's in an area that was always, always contested by the French and, um, and the Italians. And later on, as we'll see, uh, when Piedmont decides to tr help unify Italy, uh, and one of the leading military people under their, if not direct control, under their very strong influence, uh, Giuseppe Garibaldi, find, learns that part of the deal that Piedmont has made with France later on to get their support in unifying Italy is to give Nice to France, and it's his hometown, he is not pleased. So they make sure they, they encourage his invasion of Sicily at that point, because uh, Nice is rightfully Nizza, but looks very French to me these days. And of course, we can see that uh, what we think of Catalonia in northeastern Spain has been re returned to the kingdom of Spain. Uh, the red line boundary here is the German Confederation, which includes part of Prussia, part of the Kingdom of Prussia, and what will be later on become the entire Kingdom of Prussia, and all of the several states of the Northern and Southern Confederation. Later on, you'll also see that within the empire of Austria are those sections of Italy that will cause much problems for the attempted unification of Italy and they're breaking away from the control of Austria, the Austro-Hungarian Empire on. So you still have two polyglot places in Europe. One is the former Holy Roman Empire that is still this polyglot of germ, for the most part, German-speaking uh, principalities. If I zoom in here a little bit, you can see that they ha still have names like the Kingdom of Bavaria and the Kingdom of Württemberg and, and, and the Grand Duchy, Duchy of Luxembourg and, and the Kingdom of Saxony and Bohemia and what have you. Anyhow, uh, 
The other polyglot is Austro-Hungary, which has several different uh, nationalities, if you mean by nationalities, uh, language groups. There's still sp people speaking very many Slavic languages, Slovenian, uh, Croatian, Serbian, Romanian, which is a Romance language, uh, all, and of course, Hungarian, all within, and Ukrainian, by the way, all within um, Austro-Hungarian control. These hatch marks around the edges uh, are areas that were heavily garrisoned because there's still the Ottoman threat to Austria, which isn't as much of a threat as it had been in the old days, but these are still areas that were settled as buffer zones against uh, the Ottomans from the earliest days of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Okay, what about some significance? Well, cultural impact. Liberté, égalité, fraternité, in my horrible French, uh, the essence of modern liberal ideals and the foundation for what we will see as the tricolor flags of, of nationalism in the 19th century, the, the various tricolores. The equality of citizens before the law, freedom of thought and religion, freedom of the press. These became essentials to everybody in Western Europe after Napoleon and after the revolution. As Karl Marx says, the French Revolution gave rise to ideas which led beyond the ideas of the entire old world order. There were new ideas. And this wonderful quote from, that I found from Victor Hugo, whatever else may be said of it, the French Revolution was the greatest step forward by mankind since the coming of Christ. It was unfinished, I agree, but still it was sublime. It released the untapped springs of society. It softened hearts, appeased, tranquilized, enlightened, and set flowing through the world the tides of civilizations. It was good. The French Revolution was the anointing of humanity. I also mention here that the revolution is a touchstone has become a touchstone of political theory. Every political theorist, everyone at attempting to explain revolution, everyone attempting to, to argue theories of resistance and the history of the modern world includes in their take an angle on the French Revolution. There are more histories of the French Revolution than there are histories of anything. Everybody tries to make sense of it. Everybody spins a narrative, and the narrative has to do with, really, with their world, their social class, what's going on in the world at their moment in time. Everyone has a take. And it serves as the source book for all revolutionary movements. This is how you do it. Here's where the excesses intrude themselves. Here's what we've got to watch for. Who's our Robespierre, et cetera. So it becomes, it becomes if you will, a, a, a useful narrative for like everybody. The impact of Napoleon in spreading the institution of the revolution. We have the Napoleonic code of law, which still uh, is found, you know, foundational law in much of Western Europe. The Code Napoleon is, is uh, not a, an accrued system like English common law or like the United States law that was based on the precedent system inherited from the English. We have the metric system. We have educational reforms all over Europe. We have the introduction of bureaucracies 
to to organize uh, social life and to use the oh, using the bullet below it meritocratic talent the career is open to talent as it was called the bureaucracy is and the educational systems are populated by people up from the ranks by people who were educated in the new state schools and 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 they were the products of state promotions and what does this add up to if you if you sum it all together a rationalization that historically accrued layers of law custom and tradition and method were subjected to rational scrutiny and simplified let's get rid of the cobwebs um you remember the film dirty rotten scoundrels and 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 steve martin is at the table and he and he holds up his glass and he calls for new wine not that old stuff bring me new wine <laughs> well bring me simplified ways of of running a society and our last slide for today and then i'll try to leave a few minutes so people can ask questions if they want uh conservative reaction this slide could easily have been seen as the beginning of, of uh next week's slide but, but the conservative reaction to the revolution was all over the lot from uh the monarchist right the old guard was having none of it aristocratic chauvinist catholic outer enlightenment i take as a, a as an exemplary um spokesperson joseph, joseph de Maist, uh a monarchist he believed in divinely sanctioned uh monarchy is the only stable form of government the Enlightenment's rationalist critique of Christianity are responsible for the terror. He blamed the Enlightenment itself. The papacy should have temporal authority. Here's a man of the old guard. Uh, let the Pope run the world. And France has a divine mission as the instrument of good in the world and should return to its, its God-given responsibility. The Anglo-American critique, of course, is is completely off on uh another tack because it was constitutionalist in the tradition and and enlightenment using lockeanism as, as um its background and it's as its philosophical underpinning and and Whig in its political orientation. It wanted to look at the revolution as having gone too far. That that it was correct in pointing out uh, some of the inadequacies of the old world and and as uh, represented by Edmund Burke, of course, dies fairly early. Can you imagine when his re reflections on the revolution in France would have look like had he lived a couple years longer and written it after Robespierre. But his argument in that book was that there's a natural historical evolution, which he called wisdom without reflection, that indeed, if you allow societies to achieve uh, their enlightenment organically and over time, organically and incrementally over time he wanted to regard as i say in the next bullet society as an organism that is in a perpetual uh state of adaptation that this and it's different it's an ecosystem that evolves slowly and adaptively and and that reason human reason is fallible and and feeble and and indeed uh, i'm going to get back to people's questions by the way uh i'm just because i'm going to finish this in a minute um that the man's reason could not catch up 
to or penetrate the reason of the ecosystem. As the modern, the historical ecosystem, the political ecosystem, as, as modern ecology often argues, you, you only tamper with an ecosystem uh, at your own risk. So here you have a Whig theorist in the grand English tradition saying, move modestly because if you start messing with the ecosystem too aggressively, you probably have unintended consequences. So inherited tradition and custom, he wants to suggest, created institutions that can be tweaked and conserved. So he's the father of modern conservatism over time. Do it slowly, do it incrementally. And then I have this quote from Alexander Hamilton at the bottom, the practical development of this pernicious system has been seen in France. It has served as an engine to subvert all her ancient institutions, civil and religious, with all the checks that serve to mitigate the rigor of authority. It has hurried her headlong through a rapid succession of dreadful revolutions, which have laid waste to property, made havoc among the arts, overthrown cities, desolated provinces, unpeopled regions, crimsoned her soil with blood and deluged it in crime, poverty, and wretchedness. Thank you, Alexander Hamilton. And so we, I'm going to stop the share. And I'm going to address a couple of questions were raised. What was, uh, Barbara was asking, what was the educational system like in France? And what was the influence of scholars? Well, basically education um, in France was probably uh, limited to Catholic control in the, at the point of the revolution and, and village education unless it was for fairly uh, noteworthy students who came to the attention of the parish curé or abbé, was probably didn't exist. In England, uh, there had been the introduction, introduction, I should say, of various levels of what they called dame schools and church schools in the 18th century. Um, you could argue that low level literacy was, um, was probably uh, more rampant in, in England than in France in this period. I can't explain how the metric system came about other than that Napoleon Theorists thought that as they conquered new territories and everybody knew, needed new systems for weights and measures, were getting confused by all the translations that got involved. So introduced one standard of translation, uh, of measurement to uh, simplify the system for everybody. Uh, and I'm, I'm imagining that's why it came about. It certainly... Imagine if every butcher shop every 20 miles used uh, a different measurement system so that a three pound pork loin was measured as eight something in one place and it's three in one, another place and it's two and a half in a third place. Um, Laureus... Uh, Oh, the, no, my mic has not changed. It's the same one. I'm sorry about the reverb. I don't, I will try to look into that. Um, I am going to unmute.
where's that? Yeah, I'm looking for that unmute all button. You can unmute yourselves. If it was up to Hamilton and Burke, we'd still have surfed them. <laughs> you know, don't tamper with the wealthy. Don't worry. They have your best interests at heart. Believe yeah, me. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I, I think you got to give Hamilton a little more credit than that. <laughs> Hamilton's, Hamilton's critique actually sounds like Trump's critique of the cities. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. That's why I don't go to New York anymore. I'm afraid of the bloodbath so far. Right, exactly. Oh, one part of my question that I don't think you answered was, could you explain the Napoleonic Code? Isn't it guilty to a proven innocent? Uh, it may be in certain places, but it's, it's a quite elaborate coded system that I'm really okay. uh, not qualified to. I, I thought that was much. the base of it. Yeah, it may be, it actually, it actually may be, but I don't know how that, you know, they also use the uh, appointed prosecutor to direct police investigations. Mm -hmm. We'll have to ask Stanley Kowalski. <laughs> <laughs> Something here called the Napoleonic Code. <laughs> it's a so, shame that, uh, that we didn't have a, a Viscount Castlereagh at Versailles, right? Might have been yeah, changed it, it, 20 years later. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So the Germans came out feeling uh, humiliated. <laughs> what was hey, the, the German? Yeah, oh, go on. Uh, it's Ria. Would you have had the, Ameri uh, the French Revolution if you hadn't had the American Revolution? Oh, I think so. Okay. I think, I think that, I think, ex except that it might have not, you know, had the same rallying cries early on. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, one thing I, w I want to point out is that the intellectual uh, forebears mm -hmm. for the Americans were the same people. It was right, reading, right. I was reading Montesquieu. And right. It was reading Voltaire. And it was reading, right. You had and different it, social... Yeah, exactly. They they had, they all went to school. That this this is why. Um, I I noticed in somebody's house a uh, a picture of George Washington at um, you know in the winter camp, kneeling in prayer, and. Uh, in, in a in a in a very sort of uh, religious pose, and, and and what struck me when I saw it was that you know I doubt you would have gotten any of these enlightenment deus types in a kind of traditionalist prayer position. I mean, can you know the idea of seeing? Washington or Jefferson on their knees, you know, their, their, their visions of religion would have been so set by the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. But that's what I think. Anyhow. Um, you know, um, they, um, Marie Antoinette, was, it's, uh, maybe it's apocryphal that she said when asked about the people not having bread that, uh, you know, let them eat cake. But I think the interior minister at that time it was brought to his attention that the people had no bread so he said let them eat grass uh, i mean they they really they despised the people of their own nation it's amazing that they didn't see what was building up slowly under them that bomb but i guess they had held sway and control over the people for so long that they just dismissed the idea that anything could go wrong right well and also and also remember that there's the people and the people the only ones that that they would have had a vision of would have been classes that they could at least remotely recognize, like the petty bourgeois. The idea of, of a street mob or a peasantry, you know, they, they were probably regarded as something close to, to barely human. Untouchables. Yeah, exactly. Untouchables. 
Anyhow. Um, Can I grab, grab you for one more? Spain. Again? Uh, just just your, your opinion on, I understand that Spain, as the Spanish ulcer, as it was called, it was not fertile ground for the Napoleonic ideals, that one of the major problems they had, they thought that the Spanish people would, would rally to the notion of, Sp of Napoleon taking over, he eliminated the Inquisition and such. But Spain, the people just had no interest in that. Was that the control of the church for so long in the Inquisition that it left the people that they couldn't bring on any new ideas? I, th I, think, I think yes. I think that um, Spain would have looked like southern Italy, um, rural Italy, or sections of rural France for that matter where uh, a peasantry that was very Catholic, not far removed from these, the medieval serfdom, um, and very wedded to their own local ethnicity would have regarded, and in fact, in fact, there, there were several Spanish sympathizers when the Peninsular War got going and got heated up in 1812 and, and pre-Waterloo and, um, and Wellesley, uh, Wellington later on, was, was making his way through it, you know, after the battles of Salamanca and what have you. The, he was getting, he was getting lots of uh, help from Spanish resistance. There were Spanish armies that were actually just ad hoc gathering together to fight the French. And That's they had right. no interest in the, the notions of liberté and freedom and so on. That's right. Like, That's it right. was just like, like completely foreign to them. They just, hey, why would we and, want that when we got the church? And, I, and, I'm jumping, mm -hmm. I, and I'm jumping ahead in this reference, but the, um, as we'll see when we start talking about um, Italian nationalism, it was not well received in Southern Italy, who didn't really speak Italian for one thing, and, and who saw it as an imposition of some Europeans to the north of them, the, the Piedmontese. You know. Are you gonna to touch on the restoration of the French monarchy the next time? Um, which no. time? Which time? The, the, next, next lecture? No, no, but, but, but which? <laughs> The restoration of 1815. Oh, oh, after the uh, after the first revolution uh, of 1789. I'm not going to talk about. I'm not, I, I don't have the time to spend on that. There'll be some mentions of 1830 yeah. and 1848 along the way, but okay. we're we cramped. Yeah, you know, we've done it. And six. What what I have. The reason this class and several of the others that we I've done are four sessions, is that. Uh, the, when these were originally done under the ages of the adult school, um, they had been, once upon a time, had been done as six sessions. And then uh, Nancy, who was running the adult school at that time, said, I really want to, because people travel and you've got spring terms and things, reduce them to four. And so I started, so I've done them all as four. And then as I was doing this one, I don't know whether you noticed it when you registered, um, but Katie wants to return back to the sixth session layout. And I would have done it had I had the, known about this in the beginning and had time to lay out the thing. But when I realized, when she listed it for registration, I was well into by framing of a quick passing through, you know, do 90 years of European history in six hours. <laughs> it was an excellent uh, lecture, by the way. It was well, excellent. excellent, thank you. Very good. Uh, Very good. Do you thank see you, Luke. A... Okay, I'll see everybody next week. I hope they get better. <laughs> <laughs>